also written for the Washington Post, the LA Times, and, and many more. But the thing that I really liked was uh, he was on um, CBS Sunday morning with our, our pal Mo Rocca uh, talking about his, uh, his book, uh, Worst President Ever for CBS Sunday Morning. And that was a real, uh, real treat for us. I'm also pleased to have Emory Professor Patrick Olit here for the conversation with Robert. Patrick is a professor of American history at Emory University. He got his undergraduate degree at Oxford, was a graduate student at the University of California at Berkeley, held postdoctoral fellowships at Harvard Divinity School and, and Princeton. He is also an author of seven books, uh, the most recent, A Climate of Crisis, America in the Age of Environmentalism. Um, everybody that's watching can have a chance to ask questions. There's a Q&A uh, 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 portion in the bottom taskbar that you can put your questions in, and we'll get to those in a little bit. But now let's hear from Pat and, and Robert about John Marshall. Thanks very much indeed, Tony, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to begin, Robert, by asking you, um, John Marshall is a fascinating person, and as you say, he had an enormous reputation in the 19th century and was ranked right up alongside Washington as one of the most significant people in the nation's history. We, we, we remember him now as a, a great Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, do you think that he benefited in his judicial life from having previously been an active politician and having been a diplomat and having been a soldier? Well, certainly given his time period, you know, that you, you might not say the same thing today. You know, all, all of our uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, justices are lawyers and, and went to, uh, with the exception of the last one, went to Ivy League schools. She's an apostate. She only went to Notre Dame, only, you know, only a very good school. Right. So but, but in any case, uh, back in his time, though, uh, when there was not much of, you know, a, 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 a governing elite, he, he certainly uh, benefited. He was, you know, because he was a soldier. He was a diplomat. He was a congressman. He was he uh, helped to. Uh, uh, convince uh, Virginia to uh, ratify the Constitution as a state rep. Uh, he, he was Secretary of State. Uh, he was all these these things before he was Chief Justice for 34 years. And uh, as uh, I call him, it, 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 the book is the final founder, meaning uh, meaning he was the last uh, founder active in his uh, politics, but uh, or, or uh, position. But really, he was sort of like the Forrest Gump of the founders. He was everywhere. Uh, and if uh, Lynn Miranda had read a Marshall biography instead of a Hamilton biography, perhaps the musical would have been Marshall with three exclamation points. <laughs> Guy. And uh, he was able to really chart the path which the Supreme Court has followed ever since, in particular, establishing the principle of judicial supremacy. Um, is that because he had an extraordinarily forceful personality? Well, he, he was able to, to keep on going, uh, but, but yes, I, he, you know, he waited around for a good job. Uh, he, you know, he, he was offered jobs by Washington and Adams before he became Secretary of State, and he waited till that happened, and that was really late in Adams' term. But uh, what, what I imagine he saw, because it's what he did, is that he, he saw that that the, uh, the uh, legislative and executive branches were, were coming apart at the seams after Washington left. And certainly by the election of 1800, there was a, a, a tremendous amount of contention. And so he, he actually made the judicial branch what it is. It, it, it's, so, it's vaguely mentioned in the constitution to tell you the truth, but, but and it's, and its job is, is circumscribed in such a small, area in the Constitution, but he, uh, he just made it the, uh, the, the referee, in a sense, between the, the other two branches uh, and was able to uh, sustain it and convince people that, that this was the way to go. And in the, one of the crucial cases, Marbury versus Madison, he found against the administration, but he also didn't require them to actually do anything. Do you think that right. this was, I mean, to what degree is that a self-conscious 
decision in which he could establish the principle while making it as painless as possible for the Jefferson administration. Well, what's funny about today, and looking back at Marbury versus Madison, is that it's a case that everybody would have railed against uh, a conflict of interest. Uh, if you don't mind me you know, doing a little story on Marbury versus Madison, how, yeah. how it came to be. So uh, the, uh, as, as the election of 1800 uh, came, to, came uh, the, the Federalists had uh, the legislature and the presidency under John Adams. In the election, which was a complicated election, not because of the Federalists, but because of uh, Aaron Burr claiming uh, his uh, vice presidential electoral votes were equal to Jefferson's, and that took till February to uh, get adjudicated and Jefferson becoming president. You imagine, you, we're imagining this last election, but there it, it really had, uh, 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 well, anyway, it was, it was done by a bit of influence. They, they, they finally convinced the guy from Delaware to vote for the uh, uh, Jefferson, uh, Jefferson presidency by giving his father uh, uh, a, a judgeship. But be that as it may, uh, that, uh, that, that, in any case, the, the, uh, the incoming uh, legislature and presidency was going to be the Republicans, or the Republican Democrat, Democrat Republicans, or whatever you want to call the Jeffersonians. So uh, late in this time, uh, the Federalists decide they're going to uh, use the judicial branch to, to get back so they appointed, they appointed all sorts of federal officials, be they judges or, uh, 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 in this guy Marbury's case, uh, a uh, justice of the peace in Washington. So uh, it comes to uh, March 3rd, and March 4th is when the thing is going to change. And uh, uh, John Marshall, of all people, as Secretary of State, is signing the commissions for all these new uh, jurists. And uh, several of them don't get delivered uh, until later, until after March 3rd. Uh, one of them is to this guy, William Marbury. Now, normally we don't have significant Supreme Court justices, excuse me, Supreme Court cases with sort of, I, Marbury wasn't a shady character, but he was just an operator. He always had like a job here and a job there. He, he advised the Naval Department on where the where their offices should be in Washington. He, he, he did things like that. And so he was going to, he was, he was sort of fading out. The Federalists were fading out. So getting this uh, Justice of the Peace ship uh, was going to be something for him because he could probably use it for other influence and business and, and all that. Uh, so he, uh, he sues uh, to get his... Uh, 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 you know, job and, and Madison and Jefferson are obviously saying, you know, sorry, buddy, it didn't get delivered on time. Well, the person involved in getting it delivered on time is John Marshall, right? The Secretary of State. But nonetheless, he sees this, he, 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 at some point he sees this as an opportunity to do what you say, to make a Supreme Court review uh, a, a thing. So he's got this all going on, except that the Republicans, now, 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 get this, every judge in the United States was a Federalist, every judge, not six to three on the Supreme Court here, you know, because there were only Adams and, uh, and, and Washington to, to appoint these people. So, uh, so the, the, the Democrats are trying to figure out a way to, to get by. Oh, and by the way, they also passed, the, uh, well, there were six Supreme Court uh, justices, and they said, oh, we're going to go down to five. But we're not going to take somebody off now. We're going to wait until somebody quits or dies, and then you then you can't appoint anybody because we're we're going down to five. So there's all this political intrigue, and you talk about whether it's good to use politician. Well, of course it was. So so uh, anyway, he comes up with this uh, way he thinks he's going to rule if it, if it's going to rule because <laughs> the the uh, the. Uh, uh, the new legislature comes up with this uh, new plan of how when the Supreme Court is going to meet, and now it's not going to meet for another 19 months. Like so they, they abolished these sessions that they had planned. Well, finally, this time is coming up, and they're going to uh, uh, hear hear arguments on the case. 
But uh, one of the things that Marshall did is he had all of his justices stay together. It was like a team. It was like a, what do they call it? Like when they went to uh, uh, Orlando and the basketball players all had to uh, uh, be in their rooms and, and all that. So he had them all stay in one place in Washington, which was not much of a place. And we can get to that later. Uh, you know, still muddy and being built. And uh, the, the Supreme Court was supposed to meet in the basement of the Capitol. That's where they gave him space. And that basement room was sometimes used for church services on Sundays and dances on Saturdays. Because, you know, where were you going to go? Washington. But the, the, the nice building that, that, that uh, was built. Uh, anyway, so it's coming to the time for uh, these arguments to be had. And one of the justices had gout. And so he was tied up in his room. He couldn't really get to the Supreme Court and to the Capitol, which was not that far away, but, you know, gout is, is pretty painful. So what Marshall did was move the arguments to this hotel lobby. And so Marbury versus Madison was heard in a hotel lobby, you know, as if, as if the, yeah, uh, the, the story, that's why, that's why I love all these stories. The stories of, 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 of history are, are far more interesting than the dull books that my father had behind me. But, but in any case, uh, so the, so the, 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 the uh, arguments come. Madison doesn't even show up. He, he, he's, he's unconcerned about this because we haven't had much of a Supreme Court. You just think about it. When the Supreme Court starts with John Jay, uh, uh, another famous uh, founder, as a Supreme Court Chief Justice, there's nothing to hear. There's been no conflicts yet in the government. There hasn't been a government. So in the first session of the Supreme Court, there's one case and it was dismissed. So there basically was nothing. And, and so it took time and three other judges were, you know, uh, I can get into that, but I won't at this moment. And they, so it, it comes down to Marshall Hub having this uh, decision. And the decision, what Marshall does is as a politician, obviously, he's found out you got to give a bone to the other side. You know, what you see now in, 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 in the past number of years, uh, you know, everybody taking an absolute position, you know, that's not how things get done. So he gives the bone to the other side and he says that uh, Marbury is not going to get his, uh, his, uh, his sinecure, you know, down in Washington. And the reason he, he, uh, he, he could be deserving of it, but he can't be deserving of it because of the convolutions of the case went against uh, 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 the Constitution, the 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 uh, the way that these the way that the commissions were arranged. What Madison, what uh, that Madison would have to give it to him. Well, you, you can't force Madison to do what he's not uh, able to do. Madison being the new Secretary of State, and so uh, so. The, it, it, it's, it, so, of course, the Jeffersonians are sort of upset that, uh, that uh, um, uh, Marshall has, uh, has made this judicial review thing, and they think, all right, so it's going to happen here. Uh, it'll never happen again. Well, no, <laughs> it's happened again since 1801 in, in uh, you know, that, that the Supreme Court has this power to to uh, interpret the Constitution. The Constitution is what I say it is. It's supposedly what Marshall said, but you know, probably not. It is always cleaned up. So, uh, so that's how this case comes about. And like I said, in any situation now, if that came up, Marshall would have to recuse himself because he was part of the, uh, part of the process. Yeah. And one of his characteristics was his uh, introduction of the principle that the Supreme Court should de deliver a unanimous verdict and that just one of them should write it. Do you think that contributed to establishing the independent authority of the court? Well, I think it, I think it, it made, the, made the justices feel like they were somebody, I think. Now, you know, so let's just say uh, you, every decision could have been four to two until they had more uh, justices. Uh, we don't know that. But but uh, but it weren't that way. He was the he was the guy saying, "All right, now it's four to two. You know, they, they would have they would have a, uh, certainly have a 
a, a, a meeting and a, and a vote beforehand. It's four to two for you guys this time. And I'm going to write this. He wrote most of the major decisions. Uh, it's a lot of the minor ones too. But uh, he said, I'm going to write this because we're together. We're, we're a team. And sometimes the team wants oatmeal and sometimes the team wants fried eggs. And so, you know, this is the way it's going to be. We're, we're, we're going to look like we're one people. And that's why I had them stay at the same hotel when they were in town. Now, obviously, the Supreme Court didn't meet 12 months of the year back then. Oh, that doesn't meet it now. But, but it had smaller sessions and smaller times. But, uh, but he, uh, he felt that, the, that by speaking as one voice, they were going to have more power especially in the early on when, 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 like I say, the Jeffersonian said, you know, come on, this is just one little case. It's a, a guy that's a, 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 barely has any power in Washington anyway. So when did the tradition develop of the writing of concurring and dissenting opinions? Did that re-emerge later on? Yes, and, and, and it even started, I mean, there, there were on occasion somebody would write a dissenting opinion, not, not, not uh, clearly not for every case, but, but it happened even later in his term when, when he was the only Federalist left. Uh, they were all Republicans, and, and, but, but somehow he was able to, even when there were all Republicans besides him, Republican-appointed justices, that this is the way to do it. You're still going to get your vote. The vote isn't nullified. You know, you're going to win or lose the case. But if we look like a team, uh, uh, you know, just seem like uh, seem like we're, we're more authoritative. Yeah. Do you think any of that tradition lingers into our own times? Can you imagine a, a justice favoring one view, but then changing his or her mind because the majority view was on the other side? No, I don't think they changed their view. They just you know, acceded to the uh, tradition of, uh, of one, one voice uh, 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 in this particular, you know, this is the team, that, this is the side that won. Now, there is one uh, a famous case in modern times where this happened, where Earl Warren decided that the uh, Brown versus Board of Education would have to be a unanimous no. decision. And he, you know, browbeat the last justice who died soon after, into uh, that happening now. By the way, that justice had had as a clerk William Rehnquist, and William Rehnquist wrote a uh, a memorandum about how uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education should not come out this way; that it should be kept, uh, you know, separate but equal, or however you want to uh, uh, have it. But but uh, Warren was able to do it. There, there was a nice sort of uh, uh, a TV movie a few years ago uh, uh, showing this so, so more people know about it. But it, it is, it, it did, he just felt it, uh, Warren just felt this was uh, important enough to, uh, to the way society should run that, that, that a unanimous uh, uh, case uh, was almost mandatory. Good. Tell us now. now. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us now about Marshall's relations with Andrew Jackson. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, he, he didn't have wonderful relations with Andrew Jackson, but let me back up just with a guy who really he didn't have good relations with. And this is yet another one of these stories that, that, that uh, uh, has sort of strange resonance. And that's Thomas Jefferson, who was his second cousin. The, the, uh, you, you got to remember in the in the early part of uh, uh, you know just pre, prior to uh, uh, the revolutionary time, there wasn't there was an aristocracy of sorts, but it was only that that that, that you might have been there for a couple of generations and had a good job and that, and and had a, a business in England or something like this. Uh, so uh, the Randolph family was one of those families in Virginia. Now you, the other thing you have to know is that that you should know is the 1790 census was the first census, but we could go back further than that. But in 1790, Virginia had 21% of the population of the United States. So if you were from Virginia, you were somebody just by that. Uh, you know, the, the, the story is that uh, uh, in the meeting uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, come up with the Declaration of Independence, there were five uh, founders, but Adams, who was an outspoken person, 
and didn't particularly like uh, the Southerners, decided that Jefferson should write it because nobody would vote for it if a Virginian didn't, not nobody, but it, it would get more resonance with a Virginian writing it. Yeah. You know, look at all Virginians that were, you know, Washington was Virginia, Jefferson, Madison, Marshall, you know, Patrick Henry, uh, all these Virginians were, were the people we remember. Well, it's because uh, they, they were more influential. Uh, um, so he was, so his, no, you're getting, I'll get to Jackson. Don't, don't fear. But, but <laughs> his relations with Jefferson dissipated mostly because of Jefferson. Uh, so, so uh, they were second cousins, as I said. But they, they, yeah, I'm sure they knew who each other were. But Jefferson's a little older. Uh, but the other, th other thing is that uh, Marshall's eventual father-in-law married Jefferson, a woman that Jefferson proposed marriage to, and she rejected. So you know, now he's the he's the scion of this family that. Jefferson has a rejection to. And Jefferson was that kind. Of, Jefferson was also that kind of guy. He was he 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 had a lot of blue moods, and 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 I, I'm sure that once he didn't like you, he really didn't like you. Uh, uh, and Marshall was probably the same way. I don't know, but, but so that starts them off. Except that Jefferson had given Marshall went to law school for like a second and a half. Right. Went to one year of school. He goes over, he comes back from war. He comes to this, I'm really diverging from your question, but I'm gonna, uh, but I wanna tell the story. So, so he comes back from war and uh, his father has gotten some military job in Williamsburg. They, they, uh, they were really from Western uh, Virginia, uh, but, but uh, uh, they both had significant valor in the war, but they left early. So, uh, uh, Young Marshall, who was the oldest of, of a large clan, uh, comes to see his father, figuring, uh, you know, I'll find out something to do. And uh, this family in, in Williamsburg, uh, um, uh, the Amblins, have three daughters. And uh, the daughters decide, well, there's this war hero coming. Let's have a party for him. And, and uh, their father had a government job. And uh, so they come and have this party and uh, uh, Marshall comes in looking like uh, uh, John White in uh, uh, Midnight Cowboy with a fringe jacket and, and you know, sort of not well kept very, but he, this is all he had. I mean, he's coming from, you know, walk, uh, walking or riding from wherever he was coming from, New Jersey, I guess. And, and uh, so, but before that, the youngest daughter, 13-year-old Polly, 13 years old, says, I'm going to go after this guy. And the, we know all of this from the older daughter writing about it, much like the older daughter in, in Hamilton. Uh, you know, if, if anybody's seen the, the uh, uh, play or, or movie part of the play. A anyway, uh, so, so she's with, we're getting all this from her writing. I guess she kept a diary and wrote letters. And uh, uh, anyway, so he comes to the party. And, you know, everybody's sort of looking at him, oh, this is the war hero. I don't know who they were expecting, John Wayne uh, or, or something. And, and But the 13-year-old said, you know, does what she does. And she she uh, attracts him. And he is smitten. Okay, what? So he ends up sort of hanging out at their house. And he goes to what, what they would call law school, a guy named George With is the great legal scholar, and he's at William and Mary. And he, he, you go read with him. I mean, he gives lectures, and, and, and that's how it's sort of done in the law school. Jeffer, Jefferson did that. And yeah. uh, um, anyway, on we have among his papers uh, his notes from the class. And Autumn, just like junior high kids now, it would be like Polly and John. You know? Uh, M M A her name's Mary M A and uh, J M and really things like that and uh, in in his early part of attending George with lectures uh, uh, their father gets a better job in Richmond so they go off to Richmond and he's thinking about this and he says well that's enough for law school my second cousin before 
they nearly split is the governor. He's going to sign my papers. And that's what happens. Jefferson signs Marshall's papers to become a lawyer, and he heads off to Richmond. Okay. Uh, as if now, as they say, fast forward, <laughs> he's got a better job by this. Uh, by the way, becoming, well, I won't get into that now. Uh, I was going to have another story, a lost story, but let's get back to Jackson. So, uh, you know, Jackson is now the successor uh, of the, the, whatever their infighting was and intrigue, Jefferson was really sort of a, uh, he was sort of an, an operator uh, uh, who would uh, bedevil people, but he wasn't a loudmouth crazy guy. He had some truth to him. And, and certainly Madison and Monroe do and, and John Quincy Adams. But you get to J Jackson, who is just, you know, a, 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 a well, he, he's a, an, an ex-soldier. I mean, in a sense, he's a soldier in the White House. And he's a man of the people. And uh, by this time, Marshall, who, you know, like I say, barely went to school, is looked upon as an elite uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, polemicist, I guess, is what his uh, things were. But he, they're all in writing. And uh, by the way, Marshall gave great parties. Uh, uh, and as he really was a hell fellow well met. And, and, but, but his decisions really angered uh, uh, Jackson, who was a big states' rights person. And Marshall, of course, was a Federalist and believed you know, all of his succeeding great decisions built on Marbury versus Madison, that the Supreme Court has uh, these powers. And, and several of the decisions did not go uh, Jackson's way. And uh, in, in one of the last ones, he says, uh, uh, Marshall, something on the order of uh, Marshall wrote the law, let him enforce it. You know, Jackson did not enforce uh, 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 something that would have... Uh, uh, stem the tide of the slaughter of the Indians, basically yeah. Native Americans. So I finally got to it. <laughs> <laughs> now, Maybe not in full. <laughs> one of the things that's interested me very much in your book is your description of how Marshall wrote a, a, a presidential biography. In fact, he's probably the first presidential biographer in American history because he wrote a very enthusiastic laudatory biography of George Washington. And you yourself are also a presidential biographer. Um, how did you compare your approach to the subject with his? Well, let's do it this way. But, uh, Marshall, uh, I, I won't call him a sycophant of Washington, but he was an acolyte of Washington. His right. New Washington, he uh, introduced him. He, he, he worked, he uh, was uh, under him at Valley Forge. Marshall, Marshall the Younger, also Marshall the Elder. Uh, uh, he just loved Washington and uh, uh, honored every time a Washington would say something nice about him. Uh, 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 he was then, so then he became very friendly with uh, uh, Washington's nephew, Bushrod Washington, who was also a uh, Supreme Court justice. And when uh, uh, Washington dies, he uh, uh, he leaves his papers to Bushrod. By, by the way, all these founding fathers, the reason why we know so much about them and so much about their parents is they must have had an idea that they were making history. I mean, the Adams Jefferson paper and papers and Marshall's papers. And, and uh, I mean, I hear my father was a big collector of books. This is, this is his books on the paper. It says the papers of John Marshall. So you think it's not much. No, these are the abstracts of the papers of John Marshall. The, it'd be in endless volumes. I don't know how many volumes of Marshall's papers there are. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so uh, Marshall was not, well, Washington was one of the richest people in America. And so I'm guessing Bushrod, you know, was, was fairly well in. So uh, they make it a deal where, uh, uh, Marshall will write the biography from these papers of Washington, and uh, Bushrod will share in the, it. They get a publisher, of, of course. You know, you got the Supreme Court Chief Justice writing about the first president. So uh, they make it. They have this early version of a subscription for these paper for this biographies, and so uh, it's not that Marshall didn't work on them, but. Uh, 
Uh, one thing Marshall was not was a florid writer. And you got to remember that, you know, in order to have a bestseller, you're going to have to have some writing talent too. Uh, so what happens is, uh, they have, like I said, they have a subscription. It's going to be at least three volumes and people send in their money early. Well, this thing does not get done early. It's late. And people are already asking for their money back from this. And Marshall comes out with this first volume, which uh, uh, John Adams, uh, who loved Marshall, I mean, he made him Secretary of State and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He says it's the greatest thing he ever did was make Marshall a Supreme Court Chief Justice. And uh, he writes a bad review of it. And the book is not even a biography of, the first is not even a biography of Washington. It's about the beginnings of the country, you know? And so this is not what the people wanted. And it takes another few years to get out the second volume. And by that time, it's just a mess. Uh, uh, so he's very embarrassed about this, but there's a guy who uh, the uh, publisher who was in Philadelphia, which was in Philadelphia, was selling these. He was a salesman for this company. And uh, he thinks he, he thinks that, well, I can do a better job than this. And the guy's name is Mason Weems, who, invent, who did all the inventions of... Uh, of uh, uh, cherry tree. Cherry tree, right? And, and all the other myths that, that we've forgotten. And they publish it as a... Uh, I forget what they, exactly what they call it, but, you know, a piece of almost fact, you know? So the mess between fiction and fact, they admit it. They admit the cherry tree is not real, or, or maybe they don't admit that, but, but there, there are the many things made up in this to make it a myth. And we sort of needed a myth of George Washington. We, like, you know, you're, you're British. There's a lot of myths all the way back. There's Shakespeare writing about the kings. Well, is it true or not true? I don't know. It doesn't much matter whether, uh, whether uh, Henry whatever number did whatever he did in Shakespeare, but it but it's how uh, the the world remembers it, and and that's what we needed for uh, for Washington anyway. And Mason Weems sells thousands and thousands of copies of his book, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, in a great overlay of of of, uh, of the people who bought uh, Marshall's turgid uh, biography of Washington. Right. Now, when you uh, were writing, researching and writing this book, you were aware that there's already a long history of other biographies of John Marshall. What did you hope would be the distinctive contribution of yours by contrast with the others? OK, so so the way I look at history and, and this is maybe my first of all, boyhood. Uh, people can't see this room, but there's, it's filled with the books that my father had. And we lived in uh, outside of Philadelphia. My father would drag me to Philadelphia. I'd have to read all the signs. He bought me uh, whatever kid books there was. He bought me a book called Facts About the Presidents, which is like a, a money ball for presidents. You open it up and it tells you, uh, you know, uh, uh, what year and, and day uh, James Monroe's mother was when she died. You know, that sort of stuff. But what was Calvin Coolidge's... Uh, favorite pastimes, and they were throwing Indian clubs. Not even that I didn't even know what Indian clubs are, but maybe he was a juggler, I don't really know. Uh, uh, but that's what was it, I, I remember that's what was in the book. Oh, he also rode uh, a mechanical horse. Uh, you, you think, that, you think that, that, that that's something new, but Calvin Coolidge did it. So, so in any case, uh, um, it, it's, um, well, um, I have to say that, that uh, uh, knowing that there are other biographies, there's other biographies of everybody, right? There, there, there happen to be a couple of recent biographies of, uh, of Marshall, a few years older. And the, there was a famous one in the 20s by uh, a guy named Al Beveridge, who, which won the Pulitzer Prize way, way back. But uh, my view of history is that it has the word story in it. And, and, uh, and I'd say in my introduction that if you're looking for uh, a soup to nuts biography of John Marshall, here's those other books. You know, that's what you're going to find. What you're going to find from me is these little stories that I'm telling you or, or ideas that come out of history, which, uh, you know, I, I started with a, a student I mentored at my college, Carlton. We decided to do a, a, a podcast just for ourselves. 
but you can look it up, called Stand Up History. And it's, it, it is these sort of fun stories of history. They're not just facts. That, that's the problem we have. We, you know, we learn these facts as we grow up. And, and, and I'm sure you see it in, in your classes that, that you can't get it all in. So you have to decide which, you know, which uh, uh, segments of the history course that you're teaching you, you, in, in the pantheon of, of, of uh, time. Uh, so, uh, so I like to throw in these things. And I love all the little stories. And that's where this comes from. And people will find in my book that these other little semi-essays about this George Washington myth and, and how I feel it is. You know, Marshall, in, in the chaos of the 1800 election, there was sort of a little uh, thought that we would make Marshall the uh, uh, interim president until we figure it all out. So I, I have another section of other people who almost became president who could have, could have been president. I don't mean some six-party candidate. I mean people like uh, William Jennings Bryan and, and Alex Stevenson uh, uh, and Jefferson Davis, for that matter. So, uh, but, so that's what I, I sort of view history as uh, for me. I love doing the, That's why I love doing these talks. You know, I'll do these talks. For, uh, I just did another talk on James uh, uh, Buchanan, somebody wanted, you know. Uh, uh, so fine, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to blither on about him, too. Uh, and, uh, it, it continues. Well, now tell us about how you thought about the issue of describing Marshall as a slave owner and the and the history of his involvement with the slave trade, uh, which obviously was integral to the community in which he grew up and lived. Yeah, you know, the, the, uh, I, can, I can put it in the context of what is going on now. Uh, uh, somebody, I didn't know this. Somebody, uh, I did a... a, a uh, one of these talks at, at Mount Vernon, and uh, I was interviewed by a uh, professor at the University of uh, at Richmond Law School, uh, and uh, he said that you know there are there are statues. There's a statue of uh, of Marshall, my hometown, in storage in in Philadelphia, and uh, there was a thought of putting Marshall as one of the centerpieces of looking at the, you, you can see the Liberty Bell through a glass, you, you can go in, but outside towards Independence Hall, uh, it, across the street, there's a glass place for people if they don't wanna go through the whole museum to just see the Liberty Bell. So they wanted, this group wanted to put Marshall looking at the Liberty Bell, which would be, you know, Supreme Court, you know, it was, anyway, maybe they would put more people behind him, the statues behind him. But in any case, they said, well, this is not going to happen because he was a slaveholder. So, you know, yes, uh, you know, in the, in, you can, I've been studying these census figures. They're really, uh, you know, I'm a sort of a numbers guy. I mean, that's, that's why, uh, you know, before this, I was watching a baseball game. And you can't get more statistic oriented than baseball, especially now. But but uh, so I was looking at the censuses from 1790 and 1800 for for various reasons. And in 1790, there was only one state that did not have slaves, and that was Massachusetts. Every other state had slaves. My state of New Jersey had 20 27 thousand slaves. I mean, that's a lot for back then, you know. Uh, yeah, the, the, even Virginia, the largest colony, only had 800,000 people. So uh, um, uh, the slave, slaves were all over. Now, I'm not going to tell you that slavery was a great thing. But what I can say is there were many other things. We, we seem to be concentrating this, uh, heaven forbid I call it cancel culture, but, but whatever it is, on slaveholders. Well, you know, there were also the misogynists. I mean, you know, it, it, John and Abigail Adams wrote a will. Well, it wasn't valid because she was a woman. You know, so we lived in that age too. They, they, they did that. I mean, in a, in a sense, women were slaves, not, not really, not in the same way. You could get a divorce uh, uh, under certain you know, circumstances. They, they, you know, they didn't believe in child labor laws either. I mean, there was... You know, there, there are many other things that these people were. Everybody, not, not just these people, but many, many, many people, not, not just a few. I'm not talking about the uh, uh, sort of minor laws here. Uh, so, um, so, you know, you really do have to go back to context 
and and say uh, uh, Marshall did rule uh, did did a number. There's a there's a good essay about Marshall's minor rulings that that had to do with slavery, uh, um, and, and he certainly was not uh, clean on that on that issue. But it's 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 very difficult. It's, it's a very difficult thing to look back. You know, as a historian, you, to look back 200 years, you're trying to tell people what happened 200 years ago, and you're trying to tell them the parallels, but they're not all parallels. We don't have slavery. There's no nobody. I, I'm not saying there's nobody in America who didn't have a slave because maybe they came from a, a from a, a tribe in some place that had slaves. But 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 we we don't understand that as a culture. And, and, and to the extent that uh, uh, there's racism in America and, and it might have derived from slavery, I, I'm not saying that that's not true. Uh, but what I'm saying is you have to look back and say, you know, this is just, this some ways, this is the way it was. And, and, and in their culture, it wasn't wrong. And so few people, uh, John, Adams, John Adams didn't have slaves, but that's about it. You know, uh, in those early days in which you can't John Quincy Adams, the same family. But uh, you, you would have to X out everybody, everybody. And we just can't do that. No, I agree. It's a very difficult problem. And one of the challenges in teaching is to decide, is to encourage the students, at least provisionally, to put themselves into the shoes of the people they're studying and to understand that the moral values that they, that they the students have today were not shared by the people whom they're studying. On the other hand, it's also true that this was the period when the abolitionist movement was gradually becoming more powerful. And in fact, John, John Quincy Adams, when he went back into Congress, represented that point of view. Right. Do you think that Marshall was in any way sympathetic to it, or did he simply regard it as utopian? God, I would say that the, the, the latter. I would say that the, 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 he was, you know, he was from Virginia. I mean, I can't can't express it even more. And Virginia today, Virginia today is not what Virginia was then. Virginia is now uh, looking to be a, a progressive state. And it, it, it certainly wasn't in, in that time. And it was the all powerful state. When you go, you know, Marshall convinced the Virginia legislature, the Virginia special session to uh, ratify the constitution. It was a very touch and go thing. And uh, the Constitution said there was, uh, after nine states uh, uh, ratified the Constitution, uh, it would be a country or whatever, it, it would be rat uh, totally ratified. But uh, Virginia and New York hadn't done it yet. And these were the two largest states. And I can tell you, if it, uh, in my mind, if Virginia didn't ratify it, there would be another country. There would be a whole different set of circumstances in the beginning of our country. And, and Marshall was the guy against basically Patrick Henry, who was the big boss of Virginia, really, uh, who convinced the, the uh, he took it on himself to convince the uh, special session to uh, uh, ratify the constitution by only 10 votes out of nearly 200. So we, you know, we had, we had a country by this much and Marshall had a lot to do with it. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you one more question and then we'll, we'll take some questions from the audience. One of the, distinctive characteristics of biographies today is that they tend to um, uncover all the dark secrets and the more secrets they can uncover the better. Whereas I think biographies certainly back in the days of Parson Weems and perhaps Marshall as well mm -hmm. was to elevate the hero right. and, to, and to make him larger than life. Did you feel the temptation to create a hero while you were writing this biography and did you either go with it or did you work against it? Well you you know, if you go back to my biography of James Buchanan, I certainly wasn't wasn't uh, uh, looking to. Uh, uh, it was really nice writing the contrary, to tell you to tell you the truth. And, and uh, uh, but I would I would also say good things about Buchanan. You know, uh, it, it, there were these things that he was that was. If he weren't president, you might have thought he was one of the nicest guys. And, and so, so once again, you can't look at. Marshall and say that he didn't do, uh, you know, he, he, like I say, Marbury versus Madison, he should have recused himself. So have had another case. I'm sure there was another case sitting around there. Uh, he had another case where he was uh, involved in it was some of his land and his brother's land, uh, 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 you know, was uh, were, were integral parts of the, that decision and he should have recused himself. He did own slaves. 
he was, uh, 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 you know, he, he, he was faithful to his wife, but he left her when, she, you know, she, she really had a mental breakdown after uh, losing two children, uh, four children, really, two children who died into uh, uh, stillbirths. And, and so, uh, so, you know, you, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't imagine that today, or maybe you would imagine that, but he was, you know, off on his missions and in Washington and, and, and wherever. So, so, uh, no, I don't, I, I don't think the, uh, everything has to be healed, but, but you're, look, you wouldn't choose your subject if you didn't think a lot about that person. And, and, and uh, the more I found out about Marshall, the more I liked him because he, I felt like I could chat with him. He, he was, like I said, he gave good parties. Uh, I'm not a drinker, but he was. Uh, he was an athlete, and I, I fancy myself an athlete. And uh, uh, so I, I just think he, he was just uh, an interesting guy that I would love to have uh, dinner with. Great. Tony, let's go over to you. Yeah, and, and anyone that has a question, you can put it in the, the Q&A box at the uh, the bottom of the screen. There is a question, and, and Robert, you've touched on it a, a bit about um, there have been so many biographies of, of Marshall, what makes yours uh, special, different. Uh, and one of the questions was, uh, what is the most distinctive difference or original uh, thing you have have found in your interpretation of Marshall? Is it in his his writings, his his influence? Uh, what what makes him stand out the most in your mind? Okay, I, like I, I said, I, I call him the Forrest Gump of uh, of the founders. He was sort of everywhere. I love that he was everywhere. He he was uh, he, he's he was. In the last month, he's been the answer to two Jeopardy questions. One, a final Jeopardy question. One, they had his picture up, and who was he? And the other was he was he was one of the three people who, uh, but but the leader of the three people in the in a famous thing back then, and that's famous today, the X Y Z affair. He was uh, sent to uh, 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 as a commission to uh, uh, France to uh, you know get there partisanship for, for America. And he was asked to take bribes from three uh, uh, high ranking uh, officials and he refused. And he came back a hero. Uh, they, they were they were divulged as not the people who they were, but X, Y, and Z, you can find out who they are and it's it's not not, not a secret today. But but he was feted in the, in the, in New York and Philly fought, they, he comes into New York. Now you gotta remember they, they come back a month later on a boat uh, and, and he gets to Philadelphia and there's a parade bigger than the parade for Washington. He's the hero who, you know, mo despite breaking up from England, most of America was, was uh, Anglophile. There were Francophiles too, certainly like Jefferson. But, but uh, you yeah, know, so this great parade through Philadelphia, the largest city uh, in, the, in the country of all of 40,000 people. By the way, in 1790, there were, even in 1800, there were only five places in America with 10,000 or more people. So you got to look at America as a completely different place than you probably think it is. There's only New York, Philadelphia, uh, uh, Charleston, Boston, and Baltimore had more than 10,000 people. I mean, that's sort of amazing, right? Uh, uh, that, that everything was pretty much rural, and, it, and uh, uh, people got together. I don't know. They they, they didn't they didn't they, they didn't though they moved a lot. They 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 were part of their community in a in a much stronger way. So uh, uh, that that's what I liked about doing Marshall. That everything I found made him uh, 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 greater by parts. And he was obviously a very smart guy. And, and it shows you people who don't go to school and study on their own can make it. All right, you know. Back when I was in, in college, I had a professor uh, who used to say, the Constitution comes to mean what it has to mean. It has to adjust to the times. But the thing with John Marshall is he is there making decisions so early. He's really deciding what the Constitution means for later generations, isn't he? Correct. It's the same, it's the same way I don't know who you would pick for the legislature, but, but whatever Washington did is what 
is what started. He, he started it. There was, you know, it was tabula rasa. You know, Washington uh, later on decides not to run for a third term, so people don't run for third terms until we get to Roosevelt. Uh, 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 Washington uh, has a certain bearing about him. He's, he, he is sort of regal without wearing a crown. So that's how presidents looked upon themselves. You can see in Adam's writings how, how he's, he's not scared to be president. He's scared that he's going to be against what Washington decided to do. Uh, so this is this is what the you know that that John Jay and and Oliver Ellsworth did, didn't like the job of Supreme Court Chief Justice and and uh, 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 Marshall did and he decided this is the way it's going to be because once again he didn't have this quite a tabula rasa because he didn't come in first but there really wasn't much going on and he he just I mean the, the biggest decision was to try to make the judicial branch equal to the other two. And once he did that, then he could dictate uh, 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 how decisions were going to be rendered and, and what cases were going to come about. I mean, if you look at the facts of most of the of the uh, uh, great cases, Cohen's versus Virginia. I mean, you know, the, the Cohen's couldn't even vote. They were they were Jews so in Virginia. They couldn't couldn't hold office. They could they could vote. They couldn't hold office. So, but yet they're a part of the one of the biggest. Uh, 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 of uh, Marshall's cases, so uh, he he uh, he he ran through uh, uh, a lot of social uh, um, standards to 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 make what the Supreme Court what it is, and and they do revere Marshall. These these uh, I, I I I can't think of the Supreme Court of anything but elite. Who do they have to impress but each other, right? You know, they all like I said, they all but one went to Harvard or Yale. Uh, in law school or undergrad, and uh, they're not going to be uh, kicked out of office. It would be as if, uh, you, you know, was some, uh, well, Connie Mack was a baseball manager, but he was the owner of the team. He wasn't going to be fired. So that's sort of uh, uh, how you have to look at, uh, at the Supreme Court. And when you, when you go to the Supreme Court building in Washington, you see the statue of Marshall, but you also see his chair, and his chair, and even his chair is revered because, uh, 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 when a Supreme Court, new Supreme Court justice comes in on his, for his or her first day, she, they get to sit in Marshall's chair. So even those people, you know, uh, no matter what you think of the right or left in the Supreme Court, these people are Marshall today. So if you took John Marshall and put him in as chief justice of the current Supreme Court, how would he fit in? Well, I I have to say, you know, I I I, I will say that uh, you know my 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 politics are pretty liberal, but I do like John Roberts. I feel that he has this bearing about him of an old an old uh, line guy. I don't know. I think he feels that he has a uh, he's looking towards his death in a certain way. He he wants to have he wants to be on the right side of history, and uh, he 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 worries about his legacy, as I'm sure Ruth Bader Ginsburg did, and Anthony Scalia. They were they were they were not quite ideologues, but almost. But but they they cared about uh, the country past and present and future. So I think that Roberts is the uh, I hate to say this, my my liberal friends would kill me, but but Roberts is the John Marshall of today. He he uh, he certainly, I think, the leader. I think a lot of the decisions come out could come out in the same way. Uh, uh, you know this uh, collegial thing. Well, you know you might have won five to four, but we're not going to. We're 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 still on the same team, and tomorrow we're going to have to discuss another case. I, I I was just thinking if you had John Marshall on the. If you had John Marshall on the court now, um, all the justices who said, let's let's go back to what the founders wanted, uh, yeah. he, he could be there to say, well, yeah. let me tell you. Let me tell, let me tell you about that guy, John Adams. You know, let me tell you about my friend John Adams. You know, he was he was a nice guy, but you know, I I, I wanted to have a party and he's just not a drinker, you know, or something like that. You know, it, it, I, I do feel that. Uh, you know, one of the things I feel about uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I went all, I, I've, I've lived all around the country, but I'm back now uh, in Philadelphia or in Philadelphia's orbit. And uh, uh, I once worked for a TV station that was on Independence Hall. It was a block from Independence Hall. It was right by the Liberty Bell Pavilion. You know, other, other uh, famous buildings are there. And I would come out, you know, by the time we discussed the 11 o'clock news, it'd be midnight and I'd be walking home. I live not far away. And, and you know how uh, 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 street lamps have, books, uh, have sort of mists about them even when it's not raining. And, and so I come out and nobody's there. Uh, and uh, I, I see in my app an apparition of the, like Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson walking down the street, and they see Caesar Rodney from Delaware across the way, you know, and they say, "Caesar, great party the other night. We'll be over. We'll be over next Saturday," you know. And and, and down the street is where uh, 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 Aaron Burr set up Dolly and James Madison. So the, you know, the story is that the. Madison was a sort of a squirrely short guy, and uh, Dolly Madison was a young uh, widow. Her, her her husband had died in, in the epidemic in in a yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia, and uh, she would she had a son, a young son, baby son, and she'd be walking him around, and and you know, uh, uh, Burr uh, sees that Madison is interested in, in her in some way. He says, well, you know, I can introduce you. Says I, I used to live in a board, her father's boarding house down over on Chestnut Street. I mean, I I knew I knew her when she was a teenager, and so he introduces Dolly and James Madison, and they of course become a couple. So that's how the founding fathers were. That's what I look at at the story. That's what I, I feel in the aura of the of the place. And, and uh, you know, I, I I have to say that 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 I'm a contrarian. I mean, of course, I wrote a biography of James Buchanan. You can't get more contrarian than that, uh, but, but my friends will tell you that, and 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 it came from uh, studying philosophy and becoming a sports writer. It, it's a, it's the greatest preparation because if you study philosophy, and become a sports writer. The, the, what a sports writer does is look at both sides of every issue, and so I was very well trained in college to do that. Great. So that, that's how that's how. So, but but the but this dreamy feel of history has really caught me, and uh, and thinking about my father. You know who 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 was just he was just imbued with it. He just couldn't uh, he, he, like I say. I, I books. I, 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 you're looking at Patrick's books. That is about one quarter of the part of my father's library that I kept. You know, and, and I can tell you he didn't read every book. He, he certainly didn't read this stupid book about the abstracts of John Marshall. But I felt like it had to be around him. And when my wife says, "Oh, your books," you know, I, I say. Yeah, but it's sort of like, oh, I might never read this X book over here, but the feeling that it's there is important to me. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I often say um, it's, it's all about the stories. That's, it tells you the, the personality of the people and the things they did, and it gives you a, a feel for them. One last thing I was going to ask you about, uh, Patrick asked, about the uh, the biography of George Washington that uh, Marshall wrote, and I I usually speak when I give a uh, when I take people around in the museum. I often refer to John Marshall. Reasons why archivists are so protective of presidential papers as they are today, because when Bushrod gave. Uh, uh, Marshall uh, Washington's papers to write a biography. He didn't get them back for years. And when he did, they were a mess. They had been left out in the, the uh, rain. They had been nibbled on by rats. And so... <laughs> he, well, you know, I, from what I know, he took them around with him. You know, they did a thing called writing circuit. And so he had to try, even as Supreme Court Chief Justice, he had to try cases in Raleigh and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, all of Virginia and North Carolina. So I'm sure to pass the time where he had to stop over because it took him a week to get there, you know, he would take a, a chunk with him, you know, because this was the time that he's writing this. And, and, and uh, I, I'm so protective of my crap, you know, my, uh, you know, the, all the stuff that I've, I don't have collections of stuff. I have stuff that, that I bought, you know, when I was 10 and now they're worth something because I'm 70, you know, so, so uh, uh, I'm very protective of those things. And I, I, I hate when the cat is sitting here. You know, sometimes the cat 
piece on the newspaper when it comes. You know, I can read the newspaper online, but still, and I'm going to recycle it anyway. But but I feel that way too, as you do. And, and, and but can you imagine Marshall? I, I can imagine him saying, "Oh my God, you know, I I didn't want to do that to this." You know, I mean, the rats came later, I'm sure, but but uh, 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 that's that 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 yeah, so that's a good story too. It's like what what did we miss about Washington because because uh, Marshall dropped the paper in the rain somewhere? You know, <laughs> this has this has been a real treat. I have uh, really enjoyed listening to. Uh, to both of you. Um, Acapella Books, I want to remind you, Acapella Books has copies of uh, John Marshall, and they've got uh, autographed book plates in them. You can also, uh, Robert talked about his book, Worst President Ever, which is a delightful book. Uh, you can contact Acapella Books, and they'll get that ordered for you as, as well. Uh, both of them are available through, uh, through Acapella Books. Patrick, Robert, this has been such a such a real pleasure. Thank you both uh, for being here today. And uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you.